So uh, what, are, what are we, what are we going to talk about today? Well, today we're going to talk about this infrastructure we call Open Python. Um, Open Python is sort of a misnomer. It's, uh, Python is this climbing implement. I like rock climbing. And we use that together uh, with different core types. So today we're going to be talking about it together with the uh, RISC-V core. In particular, we'll be talking about how it interfaces uh, with uh, the Ariane core out of the ETH uh, Zurich. But there's lots of different other core types that we actually interface with. And I'll be talking about that a little bit, but just wanted to sort of give that uh, idea uh, in everyone's head. So uh, where did this all come from? So the Princeton Parallel Research Group is my research group. And we primarily sort of work on three different topics right now. Um, first one is we're really interested in what is computer architecture going to look like at, after the end of Moore's Law. So you know everyone sort of knows Moore's Law is ending. What's the next thing? Um, you know, specialization is happening. Um, that's probably going to come to an end soon. What is beyond the end of that? And then finally, um, you know, a portion of my group looks at how do we build computer architecture specifically for um, novel devices and qualitatively different devices. One of the things that we're really interested in is biodegradable devices. So the idea here is, let's say you want to go build a uh, IoT device. You want to go and paint it on the wall. Well, it's really easy to go paint on the wall. It's really hard to go properly recycle the thing you painted on the wall because it's made of all sorts of deadly chemicals uh, that don't really break down. So we've done some work um, in past micros, actually. We have uh, papers published about this, which look at fully biodegradable computing systems. So there's a large uh, set of students. This is uh, currently I have 10 PhD students, a postdoc, and a couple undergrads. But this has actually spanned, the Open Python project has spanned sort of longer than that. Um, just a fun aside here, my group likes to go do fun things together. So this is one of a picture from our most recent uh, trip here during ISCA this year. We also went up to the Grand Canyon and uh, uh, went camping for, for a day. So this work's supported by lots of different uh, agencies, NSF, DARPA primarily, um, some from Xilinx, some from Digilent, and then the Ariane uh, portion of it, so the RISC-V core that we uh, use that we'll be talking about today has been funded by some of the uh, EU and Swiss uh, national uh, funding uh, that's not our work, though. That's uh, ETH Zurich's work. OK, so what is, what is Open Python? And what are we going to be talking about today? So it's the world's first open source, general purpose, multi-threaded, many-core. Wow, that's a lot of, lot of things to say. But what, are, what is this really trying to do here? So we made an open source uh, many-core processor where we released all of the Verilog code for it, all the RTL, all of the test benches. We even released uh, a flow to go and uh, synthesize it and tape it out. And this is based on that we actually went and taped out this entire code base as Python. And we actually have uh, up here, we have the Python uh, system that you're welcome at the break and also afterwards to come and take a look at. Uh, you know, this is a 25 core, many core uh, that we taped out a few years ago in IBM's 32 nanometer process. But, you know, when we, when we went in the effort in doing that, we actually thought longer term and we said, okay, let's make sure we can actually make all of our code open source. Let's make sure all of our code can uh, be expandable and extensible. So we made it so that you can make bigger address spaces, make bigger sort of fabrics. And, you know, it scales, I'm going to say here, to half a billion cores. But I will say, you probably should go try to build a half billion uh, core, core uh, system because you'll probably hit some bottleneck somewhere. But we tried to really work really hard to at least not run out of namespace and at least not run out of uh, uh, other problems uh, like that. We are very, very configurable. And when I say configurable, you don't have to go hack RTL or Verilog to go and configure Open Python. This is one of the big philosophical sort of uh, choices of Open Python is we went through and have a nice uh, textual configuration file that you can change numbers of cores, uh, shape of, of cores, uh, the mesh configuration type, whether you, or the, actually the topology of the interconnect. Um, you, can shape, you can remove cores, put different core types in. You can... Um, Let's see what else. Uh, yeah, change the number of cores, change all the different sizes of the caches. Uh, you can remove floating point mutes, add floating point mutes. There's some other uh, like crypto accelerators you can remove and add. So it's very configurable from a nice text file. So you don't have to actually get in and hack RTL. But if you want to hack RTL, uh, more, more, uh, more power to you. As I said before, we include the uh, full synthesis and backend flow. Um, and this is really important if you want to actually use your results either on an FPGA. So this is the synthesis flow both for FPGA and the synthesis flow for ASICs. So if you want to do actual like, you know, research with this and try to understand this being used in uh, you know, some, uh, what to see what the clock period would be on a 14 nanometer process or something like that, you can go take this code base and go do that uh, easily. And we in include 
some reference scripts that'll get you uh, most of the way there. If you are using something like the Xilinx FPGA boards that like you have in front of you, you'll get like right there. I mean, you just type, uh, you know, make, uh, uh, and it'll just, you know, generate the instance and the bit file directly for your FPGA board. <clears throat> One thing that we've spent a lot of time doing um, is dealing with all the different sort of issues to get sort of all the way there for different simulation environments. So one of the other use cases we've uh, experienced with OpenPython is this is basically becoming a reference benchmark for the CAD community, or the computer, uh, computer aided design community. And why is this? Well, it's a ginormous open source microprocessor database, and there's not that many of them. Like basically there's this one, and there's not, not really anything else out there. So, um, in order to do that, you know, we spend a lot of time to trying to make sure that this is usable by other people. So we actually support lots of different tools. We simulate, for instance, in uh, VCS, which is the synopsis tool, uh, model sim, uh, which is the mentor tool, uh, NC sim, or whatever the incisive now, I think, what is it called now? Incisive, yeah, uh, which is the new uh, version of the cadence tool. Uh, Verilator, which is open source, uh, I won't call it a simulator, but Verilog uh, fast simulator, and Icarus Verilog, which is a, a completely open source one also. So we spent uh, and made sure our code goes through all those different front ends. It also goes through lots of different other front ends with respect to going through different synth synthesis tools. So the code is actually very vanilla at this point. Um, why is this important? Well, if anyone here has ever tried to struggle with like, oh, here's this terrible piece of Verilog code and I have to like take it and run it through some uh, CAD tool, Sometimes Verilog is not Verilog is not Verilog. It's a standard, but that doesn't mean that all Verilogs are the same. Um, well, we've taken it and it's gone through all these different things now, so we've taken out all the ambiguities in the language at this point in the, in the code base, and it's very, very uh, easy, easy to go use. As I said before, it's ASIC Verilified. We have ASIC up here. You'll be doing FPGA today. Um, and one of the really interesting things for your own architecture research studies is that we went through and characterized this uh, chip that's sitting over here and released the HPCA uh, 2018 paper and a lot more detailed results on the openpton.org website where we characterize the energy per instruction for every different type of instruction, the energy uh, for moving data on a knock, and it's, we actually published the entire code base because it's the openpton code base. So you can actually make strong statements about uh, energy per instruction and have it correlated back to the RTL code um, which is not something you can do with like a commercial processor like Intel because you don't have the original code base um, because it's not open source. Okay, what are other, some other fun things? Well, we're running uh, you know real operating systems. You know, uh, well today we'll boot Linux on your uh, system. Uh, this over here is running uh, full stack Debian Linux. Um, you know, full operating systems. And this is really good if you're trying to do let's say operating systems research or if you're trying to do like hypervisor research or things like that where you need that. So in general, you know, what is the sort of use cases we envision or we have used inside of our own group? Well, um, you know, it's been used obviously for architecture research. This is micro, you know, uh, architecture and micro architecture research. You can use it for parallel language research, parallel compilers research, operating system security. EDA community has strongly uh, bought into this right now. But so this is just sort of getting across, you know, philosophically what, what did we design this for? Okay, so a little bit more detail what we're going to talk about today. So um, OpenPython started out as a code base that we had built, which was a really fancy uncore to build a scalable uncore system where you can plug in different types of cores. The Python chip, which is up here, we actually had uh, OpenSpark T1 cores. So we didn't design the core. We leveraged a pre-existing open source uh, core. Um, and Spark is a great ISA. It's an open source ISA. You're all welcome to go use it. But it seems like it's just fallen out of favor a little bit in 20, 2019. So you know, we thought about how do we actually get other ISAs integrated. And now we have actually five different ISAs that you can use. But today, I'm going to be focusing particularly on RISC-V because people seem excited about RISC-V. Um, so you know, what, what are, what are the, the, the goal of Open Pizza plus Ariane? Well, the goal here is to develop a permissively licensed many core research platform for RISC-V, and, and what we're going to do is it's sort of a marriage here of Ariane. Ariane is from uh, ETH Zurich, um, and it is a 64-bit RISC-V core written in system Verilog, uh, Linux, cable, uh, Linux capable and permissively licensed. And then OpenPython is uh, our pre-existing system that we're going to, uh, we plug those two things together, and really what OpenPython is giving you here is a complete uh, many-core research platform together with all of the uncore, so cache coherence uh, for many core, all of the knocks or all the off chip uh, uh, things that you need to connect everything together for the uncore, all the way to the 
uh, peripherals. So for instance, we have a whole peripherals. Uh, today we'll be using on this board uh, things like Ethernet, for instance, and memory controllers, and that all exists in this uh, ecosystem. Okay, so a little bit about, um, so I gave you sort of the pitch about Open Python, and I'll tell a little bit about our collaborators uh, that worked on uh, Ariane. So uh, Ariane is an outgrowth of the pulp work. So this is work that, was, uh, being, that is currently being done at ETH Zurich and has been going on for a long time. So this was uh, started by uh, Luca Benini and um, a bunch of his students. And this is actually between uh, University of Bologna and ETH Zurich. So they have a really big team there. And it's, uh, most of it's at, I would say, ETH Zurich now. And if you go there, it's really impressive to sort of go see. They're really building some really impressive uh, permissively licensed open source uh, RISC-V cores these days. They actually originally had started with uh, OpenRISC, and then they uh, transitioned to RISC-V when RISC-V came out. And they're sort of interested in building very low power cores. So as, as it says here, their key goal is to get the most uh, bang for the energy uh, buck, if you will. And one of the interesting things is that when they did this, they originally started building small cores, and they've sort of progressively gotten to bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger cores, and now um, you know, they actually have a 64-bit you know, uh, OS-capable core, which we'll be using today. Um, so they originally started these little tiny microcontrollers that were really, really energy efficient, and they decided they actually needed an application uh, class processor, and they built their way up to going doing that. Um, also, you know, they wanted to be able to support all of the, the, the Linux uh, things you need to do. So let's take a look at what Ariane is. Uh, so Ariane is named after, for those of you who don't know, uh, the European Space Launch Vehicle. Um, so there's a rocket called Ariane. So their, their logo is also a uh, cute little rocket here. Um, so um, it's a 64-bit uh, core application class processor, as I said before. Linux capable with all of the things you need, uh, TLBs and all of the extensions you need to actually be able to go run uh, Linux has a hardware page table walker. Um, it was optimized for uh, performance, so the ETH team has taped this out multiple times. Uh, in particular, they've taped it out in uh, the 22 nanometer uh, fully depleted uh, CMOS process coming uh, out of Global Foundries, actually, interestingly. Um, and it's decent size, but it's actually sort of interesting that it's around on the same order of size of the 64 bit, uh, or maybe a little bit smaller than the uh, open. Spark core that we were using before. Um, sort of interesting to see. I mean, it's not, I mean, they're, they're maybe roughly comparable in uh, sort of size and performance at a first order. Uh, they're a little bit smaller and a little bit higher performance, but they also don't have as much of the uh, uh, extra stuff you have in like Spark that has been built up over the many years. So RISC V may, may be a little bit cleaner from that perspective. Uh, six stage pipeline in order uh, issue, out of order, write back, which saves them something. You'll see that in the pipeline diagram I show in a second. In order commit, so it's an in order processor with a little bit of out of order uh, uh, memory system going on there. And they have uh, branch fiction. So let's take a look at the Ariane uh, pipeline here. Six stages, so uh, two stage front end, three, four, five, six here, so we have uh, issue stage, so a fair amount of decode, sort of interesting extra decode. One thing you might notice that's a little bit different than like a uh, traditional sort of five stage MIPS core you might see here is their memory system is actually a little out of order here, right? So they don't have an extra memory stage. They have that occur uh, with a little bit of out of orderness in their write back. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how these two things uh, start to fit together. We'll, we're putting all these slides on the internet, so you don't have to take pictures if you don't want, but you're, you're welcome to also. Um, so um, OpenB10, as I said, is really designed to be a many-core platform, or at least a multi-core platform. Um, really designed to be a many-core platform. So we started with this notion of a tile. What is a tile? Well, a tile is going to be a core plus a slice of your last level cache plus uh, a on-chip network or a NOC uh, network on chip to be able to connect everything together. So at the beginning, you sort of have one core. Then you might want two cores. And you might want many cores. So here is a uh, very easy to build, uh, easily parameterizable uh, open Python design here. But this is not, not everything here. The, the chip is sort of like only the starting point. Um, in fact, you know, why am I saying this? Well, a lot of what's the hard things to go do and the things you don't necessarily want to go do in research, but we've already uh, put the effort in and made your lives easier, is really thought about sort of both the uncore 
and also the off-chip sort of uh, things that you need to go worry about. So we have a, a chip bridge which extends our on-chip networks off chips, and then uh, off chip, and then we can use this to go build uh, multi-chip configurations, and we can also go use this to go and talk to off-chip peripherals. So, for instance, we have uh, a DRAM controller, controller, excuse me. Uh, we have uh, a SD card controller, for instance, that we use. Uh, that's what you'll be booting off of today. You'll be booting off of an SD card, just like an off-the-shelf SD card, um, and uh, we have bunch of different bridges. So we have both a wishbone bridge and an AXI bridge. So we hook different things up to that. So we, for instance, today you'll actually be using our Ethernet controller, or actually rather the, the Xilinx Ethernet controller wrapped by us, hooked in uh, via AXI bridges into uh, the open Python system. And down here, I'm sort of showing that we have other things. Well, we've even hooked up uh, things as crazy as uh, a GPU into the system and other different core types. And we've built lots of different uh, AXI bridges that uh, we'll spend a little bit of time today talking about how we took this and actually have this run on Amazon now. So this runs on uh, at least a 12 core version of OpenPython now with Ariane cores runs on uh, Amazon's F1 instances. So I don't know if, uh, how many of you know this, but you can rent FPGAs from Amazon uh, uh, EC2 these days, uh, or their Elastic Compute Cloud these days. So this is really great. So some of you might be sitting, well, the, you know, sitting in the audience here and say, oh, the, they put these nice FPGA boards in front of me, but I don't have one of those. You don't need one of those. You can just go rent an entire platform for this for $1.60 an hour from uh, Amazon. And we went through the effort to go and actually put this on uh, Amazon's F1 instance. Okay, so let's zoom in and take a little bit of a look here at the Open Python tile. And then we're going to change this tile a little bit to talk about how this becomes Open Python plus Ariane, which is the, the RISC-V core. So uh, what, did, what did our tile look like? Well, we had originally the, uh, a modified OpenSpark T1 core. We had to do some modifications there, and we ripped off their entire memory system. As I uh, will say in a little bit, you know, we don't really care about sort of the ISA so much. We're really designing the best of breed uncore you could possibly ever think about building for many core system. <clears throat> We shim between this and the rest of our memory system. So we have a private cache, and then we have uh, some other research ideas. We actually have a traffic shaper into the mesh. You don't have to use this. This is a, uh, it was an old uh, ISCA paper that one of my students, uh, Yinchi Zhou, published a while ago in there. And then we have three on-chip networks. Why are there three? Well, we'll talk a little bit about this, uh, or Faye will talk a little bit about this in, 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 uh, later, but basically, uh, we need a request network, a response network, and a response to response network. And you need this in order not to deadlock your network when you have complex cache coherence uh, requests going on. And in fact, actually, we have 26 different message types that we have to uh, somehow squish onto three networks. And we have a very strong proof, you know, we had to go prove that this would not deadlock under any circumstances. <clears throat> also in each tile here, we have a slice of our last level cache. That's not the whole last level cache. We actually use a tile approach where each core has some portion of the last level cache, and you determine where to go uh, based on, on basically the address, and there's sort of a hashing algorithm. And we also have something, uh, a research project we call coherence domain restriction, which allows us to actually name where you want to locate things. But in general, you know, we have a slice of the last level cache uh, distributed, and we use a, a, a directory cache. So when I say directory cache, we use it, our, our system is a, uh, sort of best of breed directory based cache coherence system under the hood. Going out of our routers, we actually, uh, you can put different topologies here, but our default topology is a 2D mesh. You go to, you know, the four cardinal directions and extend off. So an important point here, as I said before, is all these designs um, are not just uh, running on FPGA, but they're silicon proven. So to talk a little bit about that, I uh, have a nice picture here uh, provided by the ETH Zurich team and to show that they've taped out Ariane multiple times now. So uh, they've taped out, particularly in uh, Global Foundry's uh, 22 nanometer, they've taped out uh, Ariane here with a bunch of other stuff and two different versions, high performance and low power version of uh, Ariane uh, running with different libraries at different speeds. You can see there's sort of a, a different uh, Performance speed here, but this is the difference between, let's say, a high performance version and a low power version. And you can sort of get that sped. But they've tested it out and tested their core. And then on the Python side, in the open Python in my group, 
you know, we've taped out a 24, excuse me, 25 core version, which is up here, um, which I uh, invite you all to come look at. Uh, this is a layout photo, and um, it was a pretty, pretty fancy design here, 25 cores, uh, three NOx, as I said, lots of uh, memory, and this was taped on IBM's 32 nanometer uh, SOI process a few years back, and I don't know barely probably read this, but it says P-I-T-O-N. This is very, very small. This is our logo on the, on the, on the die. Um, for, to test all of this, you know, we had built uh, this test set up here, which is up here. And the Piton processor is here. There is a bunch of power. We built, uh, you know, all, we over-engineered a power subsystem because this whole board was designed basically for our HPCA 2018 paper to get very detailed power numbers. And then we put our, our uh, memory controller. These are the uh, two memory chips. DRAM, uh, so DRAM's here, our Ethernet's uh, here, and we have other I.O., and we actually use a off-the-shelf Xilinx, or this is Digilent together with Xilinx FPGA board, which is sitting in front of you, that we uh, interface to through this uh, FMC uh, uh, mezzanine connector, and that allows us to uh, not have to sort of put all the risk inside of the chip that we taped out. So we de-risked the chip by putting the I.O. into the FPGA. Okay, so let's put this all together. So this was our original view of the tile, but now we're gonna sort of look at this and ask ourselves where can we go and cut this to go and add in the, the RISC-V Ariane core. So it just so happens this interface here was basically an excellent way, place to go do this. So the um, OpenSpark T1 was right through to our L level 1.5 cache. I know we probably we named this wrong. We should have named this L2 and this L3, but bear with me for right now. Um, so this is a, a private cache that I transduced from right through to right back. Um, and that was an excellent place to interface also with the Ariane uh, processor. So we were able to sort of take that, rip that out, rip out uh, this FPU, because the FPU is integrated in Ariane, and, and put down Ariane and integrate it uh, very seamlessly. And basically, when we did this, one of the really interesting things is, you know, this, this shouldn't really be that easy to do, right? We're taking a cache coherent interface bus and we're ripping out the core and putting a different core with a different ISA and a different sort of memory consistency model and, and all that sort of stuff. But actually, because uh, the flexibility of our interface and with a little bit of uh, thinking here, it was really um, easy to plug this in. And the only things we really had to sort of uh, think about were things specific to RISC-V. So for instance, we had to add a little bit of support for the RISC-V uh, RMOs, uh, so the, uh, or sorry, uh, AMOs, uh, the atomic memory operations. And we had to add a little bit of support uh, for a little bit of different sort of word size and naming that comes out the back of the, the Ariane. But it was really quite easy to do. OK, so um, a little bit about uh, where can you go use this. These are the platforms we already support. Um, natively in, in the release right now. So this is the board sitting in front of you. It's about $600 uh, academic. We fit, uh, you know, two cores on there. Uh, the VC707, we fit, what, four cores? Three or four. Three or four, depending on sort of what features you want to turn on. Um, there's even a small one, uh, Nexus Video, which is quite uh, affordable, uh, that you can fit one core on. Um, then there's uh, sort of the more expensive uh, side of the world here, um, and you can fit, uh, you know, a fair number of cores, or you can go tape out your own chip, of course, um, or, or go rent uh, for $1.60 an hour from Amazon so you don't have to go buy anything. Okay, so let me finish up a little bit here and talk a little bit about the philosophy, because I think it's sort of important to talk about the philosophy of, you know, why we did this, how this all works together. So in particular, first thing is our main value is the uncore. Our second main value is the system, a whole, provide a whole working system. And both for RISC-V and for Spark, we provide a whole working system with an operating system with real peripherals. Um, but we are not religious about ISA. And, and to make that point, we actually, as I said before, support five different ISAs. Um, the one I'm going to be talking about today is RISC-V, um, but you know, we support uh, Spark, RISC-V uh, 64-bit, RISC-V 32-bit, we support uh, actually, 32-bit x86 now. We have an a open source x86 core that's out there, and a 486 equivalent core uh, plugged into this. Um, and what's the last one? What? There's four. Okay, four ISAs. Okay, four, four ISAs. Sorry about that. Um, so but we're not really religious about ISA. We want to plug uh, different, different things in. Second thing is we're very practical. Uh, so we do not make you go use some new language. 
Uh, we don't force you to go learn uh, blue spec or chisel or one of those sorts of things. Um, our code is written in really boring Verilog. <laughs> um, our hunt core is written in basically Verilog uh, 2001, maybe a little bit of Verilog 2005, but no, not even the sort of new features of Verilog. Um, Arian is written in system Verilog, uh, but if you don't want to touch the Arian core, you don't have to, but all of our uncore and all of our cache coherence system is all written in just straight Verilog. So a little bit of system Verilog in Arian. Uh, the OpenSpark T1 core, if you don't want to go and use uh, uh, system Verilog, is all just straight Verilog code. Um, we use industry standard tools, so you don't have to go learn anything new here. Um, you know, we're, and as a philosophical perspective here, you know, we are not trying to uh, tell you to have to change everything. You know, we, we use the off-the-shelf Xilinx tools, we use the, uh, you know, synopsis tools from the back end. Excuse me. So we're using the best of breed tools here. We're not saying you have to go and buy into a whole new philosophy that is not industry standard. And, and as I said, we use the best tool for the job here, including commercial CAD tools. I would love there to be open source CAD tools. Um, we were actually part of a project that's working on that. There's a big DARPA program called IDEA that we are uh, helping with, but that's, that doesn't exist in 2019 today. You can't actually build you know, multi-billion transistor chips with uh, closed source, or with open source tools in 2019. Um, hopefully that'll be fixed in the upcoming years, and we'd love to support that, but right now we're very practical people. Um, so this is primarily, was designed for research, but industry is welcome also. We have permissive uh, licenses. Uh, so in particular, our licensing, um, all of our code that we wrote, our uncore is uh, BSD. The uh, hypervisor is uh, BSD-like. Um, Ariane is Scratch, uh, solder pad, excuse me. Linux and the T1 core is uh, GPL or LGPL. Um, depending on sort of which portions you're talking about. Um, if you don't want to touch any of the GPL code in your hardware, don't use the Ariane version, or sorry, don't use the uh, t uh, OpenSpark T1 version of this. Just stick to the RISC-V version uh, uh, and the Ariane version, and you won't have to go get your hands dirty by uh, viral licenses. Okay, so um, last, one of the big things we really uh, care about here is scalability. So, you know, we won't, as I said, this thing scales up to half a billion cores. Well, don't, you're not actually gonna be able to build that, but you know, we didn't want there to be, from a research perspective, limits in right from the beginning. So, you know, we left extra space in the addressing space. We have thought about sort of how to build scalable systems. Um, you know, if you're actually gonna build one of these with more than a thousand cores, um, which uh, you might wanna go do, you might find some bottlenecks, but ho hopefully not. You know, this is really designed to be a scalable uh, uh, system. A little bit about the community, um, you know, this is being used now by lots of different people, and, and we're, this is one of the reasons we're running these tutorials is to even get more people using it. We went through all this effort. It was a lot of effort to go build, including the uh, Python chip and the Ariane chips. Um, so we want to get the word out there and get other people using it so that you don't have to struggle as much um, building real RTL code. Um, so we're building a community. We have you know, thousands and thousands of downloads now at this point. Um, you can go to openpiton.org and get all of this. Um, you, and we actually are supporting this. So we have both a Google group and a email. So if you uh, wanna ask us a question that is not appropriate for the entire internet to see, feel free to email us at openpitonaprison.edu. But you can also use the Google group and other people are answering questions there also and there's a, there's a lively uh, community around this now. Um, let's see, anything else I wanna say here? Um, if you don't wanna to go to this website, there's also, it's also on uh, GitHub. Uh, you can go clone it. Uh, um, if you want to go do that. Okay, so you know, can you do research with this? Well, yes, we designed this to be a research platform, and what are some useful use cases? Well, sort of for all the way from the sort of top of software all the way down to like the lowest level, we sort of designed this to be usable. So first of all, you know, if you want to just use this as a software platform, we've actually had some people using this because they just want to run a RISC-V core where they can like actually use the debug capabilities correctly and maybe they don't, don't want to go buy a RISC-V system or they might have, uh, or a Sci-5 system, but they might have an FPGA board laying around or they want to try more cores than you can actually buy from Sci-5 today. You can't buy a 12 core system uh, from Sci-5 today. Um, you can go use this and people are using this for software development, for instance. So, you know, you just install Debian on it and you test the scalability. That's uh, great. Um, sort of moving down the, the stack here, 
You can use this for operating systems research, and people uh, have. So you can take this to, you know, you can recompile the kernel. All of that is open. Um, and I've had a bunch of undergrads working in my group in the past that have actually modified the Linux kernel. Um, not just to support this, it's supporting you know, the basic architecture basically just comes out of the box, but, but there's some architectural uh, new features they wanted to add that they wanted to add into the operating system and do both sort of uh, hardware software co-design together. And they could do that or they can just uh, do operating system modifications because everything is open, including the hypervisor, including all of the, the boot code. If you want to do hardware software co-design, that's really uh, pretty easy to do also. Um, I've had many, many sort of system software researchers come up to me and say, oh, I just want to add that one instruction or that one thing about like how TLBs are going to work slightly differently because then they have some OSDI paper they really want to write or something like that. And you could do that with this. You, know, you, you boot up RISC-V multi-core on a FPGA, you just hack a little bit of RTL code, you hack your OS, and you're, you're done. And that's something you can go do here, uh, which you couldn't do if you actually have, let's say, a chip that is sort of hard-coded. And you can do those ex explorations of slight uh, hardware software co-design and then uh, uh, changes. And then finally, you know, architecture, that's what we do. We, we, this is a perfect platform for doing architecture research, especially if you want to know about sort of timing information and actually going and uh, what you might need to go and tape it out. So just to give a little bit of example of things that we have actually done in the past, um, you know, we have uh, a whole bunch of different papers that we've published uh, using this, but there's also people from uh, outside. Uh, so for instance, uh, Chris uh, Fletcher, who's now at uh, UAUC, has been using this. Other people have used it for uh, dynamic voltage frequency scaling modeling. There's like a whole slew of CAD papers that have used it externally, and then a bunch of different uh, research class projects.